is um, Turkey's destruction of its Christian minorities, 1894, not persecution, destruction of, um, Christian, of its Christian minorities uh, in the years 1894 and uh, 1924. Um, Professor Dvoros Evi and myself um, closely examined the state papers of Turkey, Britain, France, and the United States and the records of missionaries uh, who worked in Turkey, mainly Americans, from 1894 until 1924. During those years, the Western powers, especially the US, had dozens of diplomats stationed in various parts of Turkey, and dozens of missionaries lived and worked around the country. They all reported what they saw and heard. Similarly, Germany had diplomats and missionaries stationed around Turkey, and we have gone over a great deal of German material, as well as some Greek materials. Our conclusion in the 30-year genocide, that's the name of the book, which was published last year, by Harvard University Press. Our conclusion in the 30-year genocide, Turkey's destruction of its Christian minorities, 1894-1924, after nine years of research and analysis, is that the three successive Turkish governments, the Ottoman regime under Abdul Hamid II before World War I, the Young Turks, or CUP, regime during World War I, and Ataturk's nationalist regime during 1919-1924, all adopted and implemented a policy geared to ridding Asia Minor of its Christian minorities. Between 1894 and 1924, Turkey's Muslim rulers destroyed the Christian communities of Asia Minor, Eastern Thrace, and the Urmia district of Persia, Armenians, Greeks, and the Syrians, in a staggered campaign of mass murder, expulsion, mass rape and abduction of women and children, and forced conversion to Islam. The campaign enjoyed mass support among the Muslim population and was carried out by Turkish soldiers, policemen and civilians, and by their helpers, chiefly Kurdish tribesmen, but also Chircassians, Chechens, and Arabs. All, estimate, all estimates of Turkey's pre-1924 populations are approximations. Ottoman official statistics tended to exaggerate the number of Muslims and reduce the number of Christians. Armenian and Greek statistics tended to exaggerate Christian numbers. The Armenians claimed that pre-1894, there were about two million Armenians in the area of present-day Turkey. The Greeks, that there were two to, between two and two and a half million Greeks. The true numbers may have been much smaller, or somewhat smaller. Uh, and there were some five to 600,000 Assyrians, Assyrians being a collection of different Eastern churches um, uh, who lived mostly in Eastern Turkey and in, on the borders of Eastern this means that in the 19th century, about 20% of the population of Asia Minor was Asia Minor being Turkey without Istanbul. Turkey without Istanbul is called Asia Minor. 20% of the population of Asia Minor 
uh, in the 19th century was Christian. And on the eve of World War I, the Christians probably numbered around 4 million, perhaps more. By 1924, at the end of the period I'm talking about, less than 2% of the Asia Minor's population was Christian. And today, incidentally, Turkey's population is 99.8% Muslim. 99.8% Muslim. Armenians claim that between 1 and 1.5 and million Armenians were murdered in 1915-1916 in what is usually referred to as the Armenian Genocide. Modern scholarship has tended to reduce this number to 600 to 800,000. But another 200,000 and perhaps as many as 300,000 died earlier during 1894-1896. Uh, some 20,000 were killed in 1909 and tens of thousands more were certainly killed during 1919-1924. So for the whole period 1894 to 1924, the number of Armenians murdered is around uh, 1 million or more. Greek historians have put the number of Ottoman Greeks killed during 1894-1924 at between 1 and 1.7 million. Uh, uh, there is no way of verifying this number, but certainly hundreds of thousands of uh, Greeks were murdered by the Turks, even the, and even the pro-Turkish historian, demographer, Justin McCarthy conceded uh, that the hundreds of thousands of Greeks were killed. Um, and as well, in addition, uh, at least a quarter of a million Assyrians were also murdered by the Turks during this 30-year period. We have concluded that at least 1.5 million and perhaps as many as 2.5 million Christians were murdered by the Turks during 1894-1924, and another 2 million were expelled, 1.3 million of them reaching Greece. During the three bouts of mass murder, tens of thousands of Christian women and children were abducted into Muslim homes and converted to Islam. Moreover, the Muslim Turks destroyed the social, economic, and cultural, religious infrastructure of the Christian communities. Almost all Christian homes in thousands of towns and villages were destroyed or taken over by Muslims, and all churches were leveled, save for a few dozen that were converted into mosques. Similarly, all Christian cemeteries were devastated. The Turkish rulers during the late 19th century came to hate their Armenian subjects. Since its inception, the Ottoman Empire had allowed Christians to live in its territory, but on condition of political and social subservience. In the eastern marchlands, the Armenian peasantry lived in a state of vassaldom, paying tribute to sedentary and roving Christian tribes and massive bribes and taxes to local officials. But with the opening up of the empire to the west, including commerce and education, the winds of liberation and nationalism, which began to affect the Turks and Arabs, also affected the urban Armenians, and to a lesser degree, the Greeks of Asia Minor. The Muslim Turks regarded the urban Armenians' increasing prosperity and demands for social and political equality as a threat to their supremacy. Similarly, Armenian demands for greater freedom and even autonomy in the eastern provinces, when coupled with Western and Russian diplomatic interventions calling for reform, and occasional threats of military intervention on behalf of the oppressed Armenians were seen by Turks as jeopardizing the empire's territorial integrity and political stability. In the late 19th century, the rise of Armenian political parties and occasional anti-Turk Armenian terrorism and resistance to Turkish and Kurdish depredations underlined the perceived multiple threat. The Hamidian regime, that is of Abdul Hamid II, the last important sultan, responded in 1894-1896 with massive anti-Armenian pogroms. These failed to elicit any foreign military intervention or even meaningful political intercession. Against the backdrop of World War I and exploiting the fog and exigencies of war, the CUP decided to finish with the Armenian problem once and for all and began to eradicate Greek and the Greek and Assyrian problems as well. Armenians were rounded up from almost every area of the country and sent inland and southwards on endless death marches. In 1914-1915, young able-bodied men were disarmed and then either murdered on the spot or consigned to military labor battalions where they died a slow death. Women, children, and the old were sent southeastwards towards the Syrian deserts around Raqqa and Deir Zor, areas we've been hearing about in the news recently. Most died along the route. Most of those who survived the deportations were murdered along the Euphrates systematically in 1916 in a second bout of mass murder. And this together is called the Armenian Genocide. 
happened in 1516. As to the Ottoman Greeks, at the start of 1914, in January 1914, the Turkish government initiated, and this is before World War I, the Turkey, which began in August, the, the Turkish government initiated a campaign of deportation and exile vis-a-vis -vis the inhabitants living on the Aegean and to a lesser extent along the Black Sea. The government using the CUP's local agents and gendarmerie and the Muslim local population, including muhajirs, immigrants, new immigrants, uh, refugees from the Balkans, that is, Muslims were fleeing the Balkans because of wars between Christians and Muslims in the Balkans. And the, the Turkish government, the Ottoman government, employed these muhajirs uh, and local uh, uh, Muslim population uh, using covert tactics, including economic boycott and low-level violence, to harass the Greeks into flight. Dozens were killed, and some 150,000 fled Greece, fled to Greece uh, during this period, the first half of 1914, before World War I began. During the subsequent World War, the Turks brutally deported inland or to Greece, which stayed out of the conflict until 1917, uh, June 1917. Hundreds of thousands more, mostly vul uh, uh, from vulnerable coastal areas, were deported inland by the Turks in the course of the war. Many thousands died in these deportations, um, to mainly Muslim villages and towns. But during the war, certainly until summer 1917, the CUP refrained from systematic mass murder vis-a-vis -vis the Greeks because they feared that this might force Greece to join the Allies in the war or, to tri or might trigger similar Greek persecution of the Balk Balkan Muslims. In the east, Turkish troops and gendarmes assisted by Kurds killed or drove out the Assyrians from the ha Hakkari region and the Urmia in Persia borders of Turkey. Uh, during 1919, 1924, this is after the war, the nationalists who under Ataturk gradually took over Turkey while engaged in wars against Russia and Armenia in the east, Greek invaders in the west and French occupation uh, forces in the south embarked on massive campaigns of ethnic cleansing to finally rid uh, the country of its Christians. The Armenians who had survived the war in situ reinforced by more than 100,000 who had survived the 1915-1916 deportations and had returned to Turkey, all of these were rounded up and redeported or deported southwards to French-held Syria or, or to Greece. Some were massacred, as in Marash in January, February 1920. But the major Turkish effort, effort of ethnic religious cleansing under a Kemal Ataturk was directed against Anatolia's Greeks. In the course of 1919-1924, following the Greek army's occupation of Smyrna, present-day Izmir, in May 1919, and the start of the Greco-Turkish War, the Turks systematically massacred and drove out the Asia Minor Greeks. Adult males were mostly executed after being taken out of towns and villages, and women and children were, Armenian-style, sent on endless death marches inland. In 1922, the Turks changed tactics and began to drive the Greeks from the interior to the ports in, on the Black Sea and Mediterranean, and from there to exile in Greece. The injection of the Greeks was completely, uh, completed after the signing of the Greek-Turkish Exchange of Population Agreement in January 1929, uh, 23, January 1923. It was implemented between October 1923 and the end of 1925, when 189,000 Greeks and 350,000 Muslims were exchanged. But by then, of course, more than a million Greeks had been expelled and hundreds of thousands murdered before this exchange of population agreement was implemented. All three stages of the anti-Christian genocide under Abdul Hamid, under the CUP, and under Ataturk were accompanied by mass rape and mass conversion. Rape was often followed by murder. The tens of thousands of Christian women and children, boys and girls, were abducted into Muslim households, Turkish, Kurdish, Arab, and converted to Islam. During the war, slave markets were set up in Aleppo and other towns where Turks and Arabs bought and sold Christian girls and women. The three stages of the genocide and religious ethnic cleansing were linked. All three were driven by anti-Christian, anti-infidel passions and carried out as a jihad, declared and egged on by the Muslim priesthood. The later avowed secularist Ataturk also enjoined his followers to slaughter and deport the Christians as part of a jihad. Particularly prominent victims of the violence were Christian priests and pastors who were in all three bouts of violence, routinely tortured and even crucified before, be, uh, before being murdered. While their churches 
uh, were turned into latrines or studios before destruction or conversion into mosques. Christian gra graveyards were invariably desecrated. Similarly, tens of thousands of Christians were forced to convert to Islam in 1894-1896 and 1915-1916. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, preferred death, and there is endless testimony of women, women throwing themselves and their children into the Euphrates and Tigris rather than face rape and conversion. While Abdul Hamid's assault on the Christians in 1894-96, involving hundreds of thousands of deaths, was not deliberately genocidal, it certainly paved the way for the genocide of 1915-1916 in various ways. As 1915-1916 paved the way for the mass murder and expulsions of 1919-1923. Each bout physically and psychologically prepared rulers and ruled and the victims for what was to follow. And the CUP leaders in World War I and Kemal subsequently understood and sometimes said that they were completing the work begun by Abdul Hamid. Each bout demonstrated what was possible. Methods too were honed as the murderous deportations of 1915 were emulated in the murderous deportations of 1920, 1923. And the earlier bouts demonstrated for the later perpetrators that it could be done with impunity the foreign powers would do nothing to save the Christians. Why did the three regimes and their Muslim populations pursue de-Christianization? And that's actually what happened, that's the uh, end result. Well, here's a list of causes, more or less in the order, in my estimation, of significance. One, the Christian minorities, especially the Armenians, were seen as a socio-economic and political threat to Muslim supremacy and the integrity of the state. Among the Turks, there was a knife in the back syndrome in which Turks came to view their Christian subjects as a mortal threat against the backdrop of a steadily geographically diminishing and externally threatened empire. Two, without a doubt, Islam played a major role in the mass murder. In the view of the believers, Islam enjoined them to fight and kill the infidel seen as the enemy of Allah and of Islam. The alleged threat to Islam was constantly invoked, especially among the mass perpetrators. Significantly, softas, uh, Muslim uh, seminarians, people who are destined to become priests, and Muslim clerics often were in the vanguard of the pogroms, as in Constantinople in September, October 9, 1895, egging on the masses to kill. Three, the rise of nationalism was a further factor. The rise of Turkish nationalist sentiment at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, embodied in the slogan, Turkey for the Turks, clearly played a role in the desire to rid Turkey of the Christian, who were, of course, viewed as non-Turks. In parallel, the rise of Armenian nationalist sentiment, and to a lesser degree, a Greek nationalism, among the Ottoman Christians, and the emergence of the Megali idea, of the Greek idea of resurrecting a large Greek empire, which would even take over Constantinople, parts of the Asia Minor, etc., even reproducing perhaps the Athenian Empire of the 5th century BC, or more recently the, the Byzantine Empire. And this was broadcast, this Megali idea was broadcast by Greek ideologues from the mainland in, in, to the in Greeks of Asia Minor, and certainly triggered, in, in, triggered Turkish fear of their Christian minority populations. Four, a major cause of the anti-Christian bouts of mass murder was the prospect of economic gain. This played on both the national and personal levels. Turkey's leaders in all three periods sought to lay their hands on the Christians' wealth, money, factories, lands, houses. They needed my, my money to finance their wars. And at least during the CU, CUP and Kemalist Kama, days uh, at the Turk, they hoped to supplant the Christians from their dominance in industry and commerce and in various trades and replace them uh, with Muslim Turks, thus creating a more Muslim Turkish economy. On the individual level, the Muslim pogromchiks indulged in murder and rapine in order to lay hold of their neighbor's property, including women and children. Five, certainly among the Muslim Turks, in all three bouts of anti-Christian mass murder, there was an element of revenge, avenging what other Christians had done or allegedly done to Muslims in the Balkans and Caucasus during the previous and self-same decades. This is readily apparent among the CUP leadership, 
that is the Young Turks, much of which, whom, many of whom originated in the Balkans. A Kamal's family, for example, Ataturk's family, came from Saloniki, um, where they, of course, lost all their property. Some of them were killed. Um, uh, others were exiled from the uh, Balkans and from the Caucasus uh, to uh, Asia Minor. And Muslims, uh, driven uh, to Asia Minor by Christian assault and persecution, wanted both revenge and assets uh, on uh, places in which to resettle. Number six, given the prevalence and non punishment of rape and abduction of women into Muslim homes, the idea of sexual gratification no doubt played a part among the perpetrators in all three bouts of mass murder. As well, the state, certainly during World War I, seems to have been proactively interested in reducing the number of Christians and increasing the number of Muslims, even by permitting, if not actually authorizing, mass sexual violence. Lastly, I'd like to uh, compare what happened during those 30 years in Turkey uh, to what happened in the Holocaust vis-a-vis -vis the Jews uh, during the 1940s. Uh, and this will highlight some of the characteristics of what happened in Turkey during those 30 years. Both the Turks in 1914-1923 and the Germans in 1939-1945 utilized the fog of war and the passions triggered by these wars to commit genocide. In both cases, the genocides were state-organized, not spontaneous local uh, eruptions disconnected from the political centers of power. A major difference between the two genocides relates to the character of the actual perpetrators. In the German case, German civilians took no part in the genocide. They may have watched as their Jewish neighbors were carted away in, for so-called resettlement in the East. They may, may or may not have known what was in store for the Jews, but they did not kill Jews and rarely actually gained possession of Jewish property because the Jewish property usually was simply uh, confiscated by the state itself. The organizers and killers during the Holocaust were German government officials and the army, the SS, police, and gendarmerie, though outside, Ger of course, Germany, outside Germany, in Poland, Romania, Hungary, etc., local civilians did occasionally take part in the, in the murders, but not German civilians during the Holocaust. In the case of Turkey, civilians played a prominent part in the actual killings often alongside soldiers, police, and gendarmes. In towns and villages around Turkey, tens of thousands of Turkish civilians, perhaps even 100,000 and more, took part in the killings and rapine, occasionally egged on by their women folk. This is clear during the pogroms of 1894-1896 and 1920-1923. Uh, but Muslim civilians also took part in murder during the deportations of 1915, uh, killing and raping women and children along the routes of march as the Christians, the Armenians, were being um, driven uh, to the deserts, the Syrian deserts, through Turkey's villages and towns. In both genocides, the perpetrating nations, Turks and Germans, made use of other peoples as auxiliaries. The Germans were helped by Ukrainians, Croats, French, Dutch auxiliaries, etc., to round up and uh, incarcerate and sometimes even kill Jews. And the Turks were helped primarily by Kurdish tribesmen, but also by Chechens, Circassians, and Arabs in the murder of the, of the Christians. Both the Turks and the Germans made use of specific killing organizations to lead or help carry out the mass murder. The Turks had the special organization, that's what, that's what it was called, and the Germans, the Einsatzgruppen, or more broadly, the SS. In the case of Germany, the Holocaust was an aberration in German history, a, a mad five or six year campaign by a single aberrant regime. In the case of Turkey, we are speaking of a 30-year period and by three successive regimes bent on suppressing the Christian minorities under Abdul Hamid and ridding the country of them completely, we're talking about the CUP and the Ataturk. Ultimately, all three can be seen as on a trajectory carrying out a single policy with one aim. This can be hardly be called an aberration. A major difference between the two genocides relates to rape, abduction, and conversion. The Germans forbade sex between Aryans and Jews and generally punished rape of Jewish women. The rape, rapes here and there occurred. Similarly, there was no induction of Jewish women and children into Ar Aryan German homes, and conversion was never an option uh, in, and could not save Jews from death. In the Turkish case, mass rape of Christians was the norm and went unpunished, and the induction of Christians into Muslim homes and conversion was generally encouraged, if not authorized, by the state. Both the Germans and the Turks used systematic deception during their campaigns of mass murder to deceive outsiders about what was happening 
and to deceive the victims so that they would uh, go unresisting to their deaths. They both, in fact, uh, used the phrase resettlement in the East rather than telling people they were going to their deaths. Both regimes knew they were engaged in massive crimes and tried to hide them. The Turks under Talat's and instruction, Talat was um, the prime facilitator, the, the Minister of Interior uh, during World War I, um, he instructed people to bury the bodies uh, and other traces of the mass murder uh, during World War I, and the Germans tried to systematically destroy the body, bodies and, ex and, and extermination camps themselves uh, towards the end of World War II. In both genocides, the victims, by and large, went like sheep to the slaughter. In the Turkish case, Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians largely went like sheep to the slaughter, though here and there, in Van, Musadag, Zeytun, there were hero heroic acts of resistance. The same is true of the Jews during the Holocaust, though here too, going uh, as sheep to the slaughter, though here too, as in the Warsaw Ghetto and Treblinka uprisings, uh, there were sporadic, brave acts of resistance. In both genocides, foreign powers did next to nothing to help the victim populations. During 1894, 1914, 1918, and 1919, 1923, the foreign powers, Britain, the United States, Russia, France, occasionally protested, remonstrated, or condemned for Turkey for its crimes against humanity and genocide. That phrase, crimes against humanity, comes from this period. But they did nothing militarily to halt the slaughter. The sole exception was the French naval re rescue of the survivors of Musadag. It is on the Mediterranean coast. If you want in the question and answer period, I'll tell you the story. Similarly, the Allies in World War II occasionally issued protests and condemnations, but did nothing. No bombing of the Nazi railway lines or camps, as occasionally demanded, to halt the slaughter of the Jews by military means. Lastly, there was little dissent with each, within each perpetrating country. During Turkey's destruction of its Christians, here and there, valleys and mutasarifs, that is governors, local and provincial, turgiversated or delayed implementing orders to murder. Here and there, there were, was outright refusal by officials to lend a hand. But by and large, there was little resistance or dissent by Muslim Turks. One or two local governors were punished, one or two were executed by the CUP, a few were removed from office, but that was it. Similarly, in Germany, there was little dissent or resistance to the destruction of the Jews. One or two officers sent appeals and information about what was happening out of Germany, but that was it, even though the few who refused to take part in the killings were generally not punished severely. One last thought. One can easily, and this isn't in the book, incidentally, this is my own thinking, um, on which uh, there is a disagreement between myself and um, the, my co-author. Um, one can easily situate, it, is situate Turkey's destruction of its Christians within the context of the 1,500-year-long clash between Islam and the West, the so-called clash of civilizations. In the history of the West's encounter with Islam since the 7th century, there have been four extended bouts or waves of holy war from the Muslim side. In the 7th and 8th centuries, with Islam's emergence, the Muslim Arabs waged offensive jihad during the conquest of Hijaz, the Middle East, and North Africa, as far north, in fact, as France. During the 11th and 13th, 13th centuries, the Muslims of the Middle East waged a defensive jihad in response to the Crusades' conquest or attempts to conquer uh, the Holy Land. During the 15th to 17th centuries, the Ottoman Turks, and this is the third stage, uh, during the third bout of uh, warfare uh, between Islam and the West, during the 15th to 17th centuries, the Ottoman Turks waged offensive jihad against Christendom, conquering Istanbul, uh, Constantinople and attempting to conquer Budapest and Vienna in their drive to penetrate Central Europe. Ultimately the, ultimately, the Ottomans were pushed back while retaining Constantinople. Now we are in the midst of the fourth wave of jihad, which many Muslims define as defensive. They include, uh, they, including bin Laden, see it, uh, this jihad against the West, as an effort to repel Western Christian aggression and penetration of the Islamic world culturally, economically, militarily, and politically. This wave can be said to have begun with the anti-Christian pogroms in Damascus and Lebanon in 1860. The centerpiece of this wave to date has been Turkey's assault on its, on its Christian minorities during 1894-1924. One may also include in this Muslim effort to uh, in this the, the Muslim effort to destroy the Jewish uh, Zionist enterprise during the 20th century. Most Muslims and Israeli Jews, incidentally, view Israel as a Western outpost in the midst of the Muslim Arab world. And certainly the rise and ongoing activities of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and more subtly, 
Turkey's diplomatic and quasi-military -mil activities are expressions of the continuation of this fourth jihadi wave against the West. That's it. Certainly under Erdogan, uh, Turkish policy has reverted completely to denial, basically, of Turkey's role in what happened in 1894-1934. They deny genocide, they even deny large-scale massacres. They say if there were massacres, it was local officials being too zealous. It wasn't from the central government, which any of this came out. Um, um, they basically describe what happened, certainly during World War I, as civil war between the Muslim population and the Christians, um, and both sides killed each other. Muslims were killed, Christians were killed. Uh, no, no, no talk about mass murder, mass expulsions, mass um, um, genocide, essentially. Denial. Um, it's a bit strange, in fact, because the world is sort of quite open. There is internet. Uh, Turks can learn from historians, and most historians in the West agree with what basically the thesis I've been presenting, though there are Turkish historians that say back the government's position, but they, the, the Turks or the uh, literate Turks, uh, educated Turks, can get access to the information books that have been come out in Turkey, uh, which uh, have also dis in some uh, way discussed this subject, uh, always focusing on Armenians, not on the Greeks and the Syrians, they're usually not mentioned at all, what's happened to them. Um, but nonetheless, they maintain this denial and celebrate uh, even uh, uh, um, Erdogan on the 24th of October, that's the day the Armenians mark their genocide each year. That's the day that Turkey in 1915 proclaimed uh, and arrested uh, the, the Armenian leadership in Istanbul, in Constantinople, and in other places. Um, Turkey marks that day to uh, commemorate World War I and the, the conquest of Gal uh, in Gallipoli, or the, the, the resistance in Gallipoli to the Western invasion uh, through the Dardanelles. But actually, the Turks aren't alone in this, of course. The Japanese also either deny or ignore um, their doings against the Chinese, millions of dead, uh, uh, torture of prisoners of war, and tens of thousands of killings, and so on. The <coughs> denial exists in other places, not just in Turkey. Yeah, uh, during the Greco-Turkish War, so the, the Greeks uh, got as far east as Konya and occupied Western Asia Minor. So. How was their treatment of the local Muslim population during the occupation? Okay, I go into that in the book. There was a governor, the Greeks appointed a commissioner, a governor, if you like, man from Sturgiadis, um, I think he was a Cretan originally, uh, to govern that area, to administer it. There was an army which was busy fighting the Turks on the edges of that area, which reached almost as far as Ankara, in fact, mm -hmm. the Greek advance at one point. And they had a